Welcome back to the Planet Green Trees. This is, of course, episode 150, 150 episodes insane, called The Redden Case. So, uh, David Radoy, let's talk a little bit about the Bob Redden Case, and then we're going to go to Rick with the news. Uh, so, Rick, get ready for that. David, what are your uh, reflections on some of the uh, issues that came up in the case, if you would? Well, I think... Uh... <clears throat> This case has been a fight from the beginning. Uh, I've been on the case for approximately 15 months. Um, I thought we were going to file some motions, get them ruled on, probably get the medical marijuana defense at trial since that's what the Court of Appeals pretty much said based on the preliminary examination. Um, And this was the first Court of Appeals case, really. And they stated in there that there's issues of fact for, for the trier of fact and that the medical marijuana Section 8 defense needs to go to a jury. So I, you know, when I when I got on this case, I figured it's going to be pretty quick. We're going to get right to uh, we're going to get right to a jury trial pretty quick. Then I uncovered, you know, that there were a lot of other issues going on here with the search warrant. Um, you know, it appeared to me that the search warrant wasn't even present at the time that the search was commenced. They showed up with it afterwards. Uh, Let's talk about that a little bit. That was something that was strange. Uh, we were able to argue one very, very limited issue. And you would think, most people, this is another one of those things where like, people hear how the law works. They're like, what? Kind of like forfeiture laws or uh, there's other ones that come to mind. But when you hear that um, there's an issue with the search warrant, you somehow have to present evidence and proof that there's that the officer's lying or you know that there's something very specifically relevant that was intentionally omitted these are difficult things to prove that is the burden of the defense in order to be able to challenge the affidavit of the search warrant um and we had very specific things that we presented the court had no interest in granting us that we are agreeing that we met that threshold so we were limited to this very <clears throat> You know, weird issue, which is whether or not the search warrant was present at the location at the time that they executed it. And the reason why it was so unusual was that all the stampings from the fax machine that would have represented a time sequence of when it would have been sent to the magistrate and then sent back to whatever that office was, were not collaborating with the story told by the police of when they had the warrant. David, take it from there. Yeah, well... You know, and then we were eventually summarily denied our right to challenge, you know, the other parts of the search warrant, which you talked about in your rant. Um, You know, the search warrant was largely based on a trash pull where they claimed that they, you know, they had some residue of marijuana on a bag and that they tested that. And we uncovered, you know, that that tester that they used, you need a certain amount of actual product. And residue on the side of the bag is not enough. Now, we weren't even allowed the right to inspect what it is exactly that they tested. We're just supposed to go off the word of the police that this happened. Um, Then the police get there, you know, get to Bob's house, and they say, aren't you on probation? Because they think that they, you know, they're allowed to search anybody's house who's on probation. Well, Bob wasn't on probation. Um, So basically... And then they didn't produce the search warrant until well into the search. Who knows whether or not they had it at the time. Um, All we can say is that they didn't actually give it to Bob. Um, You know, and then we are just denied on, like, every single motion, basically, besides what the prosecutor knew she had to stipulate to, or else we are just going to get this case overturned on appeal no matter what. Um, I I still feel, even after the 15-month fight and everything else and, you know, it was a little bit anticlimactic uh, that a plea was entered in this case. But if you look at the plea that was entered and the resulting sentence that's going to happen or we believe is going to happen, that's be agreed to, um, this was a win. You know, and it wasn't a win for the whole medical marijuana community. But what I can say is we broke the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office. They did not want to give us a deal. We were fighting for 12 months. No deals, no deals, no deals. And then, you know, with enough work, diligent use of, you know, this brief writing and, and, you know, I think that, you know, a few big Supreme Court cases helped us out as well. Not giving um, up. 
yeah. the you know the prosecutor's office finally folded and offered a deal that was gonna you know that was gonna give us what we wanted, which was basically you know to stop dragging these two sick people who truly need medical marijuana through this court process. We're going on over four years. And, you know, at least they're done being drugged through the mud through this court process, having to show up day after day, um, having to be on bond and have bond conditions. And, you know, at the end of this, um, they can go back to their normal lives. I still think it's a win. Um, You know, many people think that pleading guilty to any crime here was not a win. Um, And, you know, I I feel that way a little bit as well. Um, But in the end, when the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office is an office that says no deals on medical marijuana cases, no deals of any kind, no deals, and for four years was saying no deals, and finally they're willing to go from a seven-year felony to a one-year misdemeanor with a six-month non-reporting probation term with no testing, um, that's a win. No matter how you look at it, they broke. We broke them. They said no deals, and they gave us not just a deal, but a really good deal. Um, that would be a good deal in any county, and but especially in Oakland County, that's a real deal. Can you even think of another similar deal in recent? Can you think of another similar deal in recent history, uh, Michael or David? I think those deals happen. Not, I've had cases with similar deals to that, but where there's a lot of other issues going on, not just pure medical marijuana issues. That where it's so politicized. I mean, this case was really stressing whether or not the Section 8 defense was going to be valid. And I think that's what scared the Oakland County Prosecutor's Office is because they knew that me and Mike and that Bob and Tori, along with us, were going to keep fighting and that we were going to take this as far as it needed to go to say that the Section 8 defense does have meaning, that you can't just push out the Section 8 defense and say it's not going to protect them because they didn't have a card. The act was passed at the time of the raid on Bob's house. And, um, you know, there's a Section 8 defense, which is very specifically for people that are not registered medical marijuana patients or caregivers. They're unregistered. Definitely applied to us perfectly. All right, right, listen to Planet Green Juice, episode 150. In the studio, we've got David Rodoy from Rodoy Law, Rick Thompson. We're going to go to the news with him in a few minutes. Jamie Lowell, Third Coast Compassion, Chad. Premier Compassion Center, and Bob Redden himself. Bob, we're talking about you. We're talking about your case. I want to ask you a few questions or have you comment, but I may jump in if you see something that I don't want you to say, as any lawyer should. Compassion Club, Birmingham Compassion Club, sorry. Well, I'd like to thank the attorney, Mr. David Rudo, and Mr. Camoyne for helping us, me and Tori. I'd like to tell Tori, I love you very much, Tori. It takes a lot of uh, <clears throat> teamwork to stay together on a with this kind of stress in any relationship, you know. <clears throat> relationships themselves, you know, when they throw a little court case in, drag a couple of people in, it uh, adds to the challenges, one would say. So, Bob, um, what do you have to say? I mean, you know, we, I guess if we were going to ask about, uh, did you ever think this case would... Uh, Resolve about how it did, or did you think it was going to be one that was going to? I was very surprised at the uh, deal offering. I was really, I had no anticipating it at all. I, I watched my share of Perry Mason, but I never expected this out of the prosecutor's office at all. It really threw me for a loop. I can say the exact same thing. I There was never a moment from I don't know when that ever crossed my mind that this was going to happen. Seriously, it was a weird, and it, it always happens that way. They were really pursuing it as a religious matter, it seemed like to me, and uh, they were not going to quit for a long time. Section 8 is pretty huge for the community. Yeah. We need it to be intact. Well, so we never thought it was going to be this way. And, um, you know, the issue is why, you know, why does someone resolve a case? There's a lot of different reasons. I mean, people. You know, there's lesser charges that someone resolves just to avoid certain consequences that relate to a certain conviction. I mean, I had a case this afternoon that, you know, we're trying, you know, it was innocuous, like meaningless. Prosecutor's office has to take something. They can't just 
take your stuff. If you're going to make it go away, you're going to have to beat them down or you're going to have to, you know, lose. And that's what, you know, so here's a situation where I've been here many times. I mean, in 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 each case has got to be identified independently. You know, there was a case in uh, Macomb County where uh, Craigslist, like four or five transactions with the undercover police officer resulted in five cases with, you know, two or three counts in each one. And they went to his house. So there's a sixth case and it's got six files with two or three felonies in each file, you know, and they offered him a one year and well, plead to one misdemeanor, 7411, three months probation. You know, and, you know, the idea is like, what else? I mean, you know, some people want to fight it to the end and I'm all in favor of that. Believe me. That's how you, uh, stomp it out. But each case is individualized. Bob, t- talk about that a little bit. I mean, what's it like to, uh, what's your, you know, one of the things that people may also not understand is your unique experience in that this Oakland County court system, different than most others. What, 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 are, what are your, and I know you go to a lot of courts. How would you describe the experience there compared to what you see in other locations? In Oakland County, they seem to be a little stronger politically. I think that's the biggest reason that you'll see different changes, but with our case in particular was that we were standing up for every patient in our community because we knew that both me and Tori definitely had qualifications to uh, use cannabis for our medicine. And that is the point that I was trying to make earlier, which is that despite that fact, <clears throat> even though I would, we don't know what, what it would take to prove this point that issue still remain and even though you are without question and I said 10 out of 10 doctors would say you meet that criterion but to get to the jury <clears throat> they would say you know that how many more people like me and Tori are going to have to go through the same thing to get there well I think it's ending and I think you know that this is one of the reasons why as we've been talking at least at this point before we have the absolute solution, what I'm calling the soon to becoming gold standard certification model or doctor participation, until such time, I think the most important thing we can do is uh, bring this to the listener and community's attention that uh, if the worst case scenario happens, you find yourself in court, and the attack is going to seemingly be on the doctor patient bona fide certification. And that would be independent of however sick or debilitated the person is. And that's the most important point, that education. The education point is that there needs to be, it's not enough to just be sick and see a doctor once, come back in two years. That may be a prevailing view in our community, and it's it's nobody's fault that it's wrong. But the point is that it needs to be realized. When a, The other point is this, that what has normally been known as a physician having the authority and direction to interact and direct the patient at their own discretion is now being evaluated by non-doctors who are prosecutors. And this is the first time something like this has ever happened in medicine. And uh, well, I think we're going to win in that. I really do, eventually. I do. I, I do as well. But... Um, point is that uh, there needs to be a conscious awareness of what the certification is meant to be for purposes in you know what, what its purpose is and it's to be able to defend yourself in court so you the entire your own best defense your physician is your own best defense and your interactions with the physician are uh, critical especially under the new amendments as of April 1st the definition of a bona fide doctor patient relationship is more I mean, as defined as it's clearly as it's going to be. And um, people need to be more aware of that. And the other point that I want to make is this, is just because your certified physician does it a certain way, I'm suggesting to you, patient community, have the understanding that you need to take more responsibility for your certification. Absolutely. Just because the physician is suggesting, and we've all become, you know, almost conditioned to 
If the doctor tells us, the doctor leads us, we will follow. The, our whole community is set up in a way that that discretion is authorized. We let the doctors do that in the privacy of the office, except for here. So I'm just saying be aware of this and expect from the doctor that they want to see you within six months for follow-up. He may welcome that. They might. They should. Absolutely. That they want to receive from you updates throughout the months afterwards. We want the doctor to be able to say that they know that you're using cannabis and it's working for you. That's one of the things that a physician should be looking for, that they can attest to those facts after the certification. It would be good that they know whether or not cannabis is helping or hurting because it's, the whole point of this is that it's being treated as medicine and the doctor's involvement in it is part of the process, at least in terms of how they're interacting with the patient. Whether I believe that the law was intended to mean this or not, and all I'm talking about really is this moment in time, the worst case scenario, when you got to get over prong one and there's issues about, despite the fact that you're sick and debilitated, that you actually are being the challenged. Two, and the other two prongs that you have to meet are a, little, a lot more easier. Of course. It's all about the medical use. It's, it's about the patient. And you know what I think at the end of the day, at trial, I, I believe that you know, the, I don't want to talk about it now because it's going to be my strategy for tomorrow. But, uh, ask your doctor if he'll testify for you. There you go. How about Key. instead of ask your doctor, insist on it. Uh, I think the patients, and you're, you're saying something that, that's fantastic, correct, but the patients are in control of what goes on, and you choose who you give your money to. And if if the difference between a satisfactory certification and a non-satisfactory certification is simply financial, most people would want to overcome that hurdle. You may say he will testify until it comes time. Well, that's why we, we've oftentimes talked about having a patient-doctor contract where uh, there's a, a signed document stating these are obligations and responsibilities, in which case the patient could be obligated to return. Part in the gold seal. Uh, exactly correct. Uh, uh, return in six months or return in four months, whatever the doctor deems is necessary at that particular time. But that would be their consequence, and then and the consequence for the doctor would, of course, be the opportunity to uh, have to go to court to represent. You don't always get what you want when you force somebody to do something. I would agree, which is why having a legally signed document ahead of time would, would make it much easier. Not only that, it would also uh, help patients differentiate the physicians who are going to be stand-up and the ones who are not, because obviously some that would shy away from that type of an obligation, um, you know, the, those are your fly-by-night guys that are probably going to get weeded out anyway. Demand it. Demand it. I, I, I completely agree. I think the patient set the standard. You were you were a little ways away from that. You know, it's unfortunate because uh, this is just all nonsense. We are talking about, you know, making certain that an issue that's going to be challenged in court, having the foresight to make it less challengeable. Um, but there's there should be some concepts here, which is that number one, the only reason you get a card, the only reason you go to a doctor for this is in case you need to call them in court. So. The doctor really should be looking at it. The, the, what would it take for me to feel comfortable to come to court to defend my certification, right? And what is this patient going to need to do between this period of time and that period of time for me to say with a full chart that I can meet this requirement? And likewise, the patient should be asking themselves, what do I have to do on my end That's all they want to, know. to be able to codify without question that I am bona fide with this physician. Too often we hear our friend who's uh, wishing our best to John Targowski. We had a little go around a few months ago about, you know, the worst answers given to questions in the first interview with the client. And in response to who's your certifying physician, oftentimes we hear cannabis cup or I don't know, you know, that guy over at the uh, place at the uh, whatever, but, Arguably, if you have a serious or debilitating condition and have had any kind of treatments where well, it's surgery or anything that's addressing a serious or debilitating condition, you're going to remember the doctor's name. I do say that I know a lot of people do not have health insurance and don't regularly go to a doctor, and some of it they've determined on their own, and it's homeopathic, and I am not in any way suggesting that it should be done in any other way, or even the, the need for this is, is, is absurd, but as we discuss in the context of Michigan law 
in the uh, how to protect yourself. How to protect yourself. Silver lining as, is I don't think it's going to go on very long. I think that this is a failed attempt. I think just the general principle that when juries hear that the government is intruding upon this, you know, like sacred area in the doctor's office and what goes on there is, uh, I think that there's, they're overestimating. I think that this is going to be appealing to the masses. I think the more, more people are like judge Turner, Bob, you know what I mean? Like not, not like the prosecutor's office where they, where they want to criticize, you know, where most doctors don't even, you know, you think of all the ways in which a doctor interacts with a patient within seconds and is somehow treating them. You know, it's all the time. Anesthesiologists. Yeah, we've never experienced anything like this with other with doctors, uh, any other type of medication. None. So my point is, I guess I don't think I hope it's not going to. I don't think it's going to go on much longer. I think it's just as initial phases. No, but that's what scares me. If it doesn't, if, if the near, if the uh, time is near soon ending. Then they must be contemplating some type of other move because they're, they're just not going to just leave everybody alone. Well, I think that uh, I think they're going to fight this thing a lot. I think I think that you know the community is in a position where there needs to be a, a dramatic step forward from what we've come to know as the general certification process. I mean, I don't think that this law was intended for this. I'm speaking from a legal percep- perception, evaluating a patient's medical chart by the certification doctor and saying it needs to be better and it's to be a conscientious effort on the part of the community to realize this and take some responsibility for it and responsibility for your own medical chart envisioning what you want it to look like in the worst case scenario. It's a little bit of extra work, but <clears throat> what worries me is if, if the- if the government thinks that you know that they're losing some ground on this war of cannabis and medical cannabis in Michigan, then if they can't win in court, they might decide to do something in Lansing. That's what bothers me. Well, you know, unfortunately, the failure of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, as we said, has been the lack of protections in Section Four. They could have, should have, you know, not made it arrestable if a husband and wife are growing together in a basement. They could have said that's not a big deal. But no, they said you, that's arrestable. But you can defend yourself at trial in Section 8. Eight card-to-card transfers. One judge said it's okay. The other one said, no, 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 no. You're not going to be protected from arrest to come up with an asymmetrical you know, menagerie of philosophy kind of explanation of this. But you can defend yourself under Section 8 if that transfer takes place. So it's failed. I mean, those could have been protections, should have been protections. I think the voters intended them to be. The law was intended to be read broadly. That's the hardest pill to swallow, I seem seem to think, that still wants to narrow it. And the Supreme Court's done that, but they have provided the path, which is the tools for Section 8 hearing and, you know, the path on to trial. And the only area that is challengeable in most of these cases, is the seemingly attack of the doctor-patient relationship, and I just think that you know awareness on this topic and uh, purpose. I did not have known what where, uh, what Judge O'Connor's was talking about when he wrote that opinion the first time you read it. But if you go back and read it again, it all is a map there. All That's true, there. but he was but it was it was shut down. I mean, it was it was like the it was like the uh, you know, war plans. It was like the war plans, like how to bomb. And, you know, like they assembled the troops. They'd gone forward. They got through most of the country. And then all of a sudden, you know, the 7-0 majority said, no, no, no. They just bombed them back and shut it down. But you're right. That was the battle plan. They had a lot of people on board. I mean, I thank God for justice. You know what I mean? Thank God for, I mean. Supreme Court does this. I almost think that their their biggest advocate was their worst enemy. Tim Beck has agreed with me on this, that that attorney general's, sorry, the producers give me, but that, that attorney general's overzealousness and his seeming stepping outside of the executive branch and into the 
influencing the legislature like he did and the voters initiative was what drew the majority together by the Supreme Court. Up, as he was setting up his political uh, maneuvers himself. Because, you know, Mr. Cox, when he was in there, we asked him many a time to come clarify some things for us. He stayed way away. Sure. But I think he was his worst enemy because of the fact. All right, so I think we're going to go to the uh, callers or wait, 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 Rick with the news real quick. No, we've got a we got a scheduled call. All right. Steve, is, Steve Green, I think is on. Steve Green from the Human Solution. Thanks for calling. Where we are. Uh, no advance schedule. Steve, thanks for calling. How, how are things? Good, good. How are you guys doing today? How's the show sounding? He doesn't want to have to answer that question. Apparently, <laughs> I plead the fifth. You should too. <laughs> yeah. So, Steve, you're with the Cannabis Court Crusaders, and you're here to uh, update us on some of the court battles that are going on in Michigan and how people can participate? Yes, for sure. Um, we have uh, we started as the Cannabis Court Crusaders in Michigan, and then we uh, joined in with uh, a national group, the Human Solution, and uh, started the Michigan chapter of that. Uh, from there, we have the Facebook page, um, the Cannabis Court Crusaders, and that group updates everything. 10 a.m., uh, Judge Frank Fort Morris courtroom. And then. Building in Telegraph. So I think that's one of the dates that. That's my sentencing date. I know Bob doesn't have headphones on. He can't hear that you're speaking. I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead, okay, go no ahead. problem. And uh, so Cannabis Court Crusaders on uh, Facebook has all the updates. And then uh, the website for uh, THS hyphen or dash uh, mi.org has uh, a calendar that uh, has uh, upcoming court dates and what's going on. Uh, one of the ones out right now um, is a poor guy uh, named Jonathan that uh, got a videotape of when he was uh, arrested and he tried, you know, asserting his rights and ended up being tased and a, a few other things happened to him. Um, and it was all captured on on uh, tape, so that was something that's been uh, recorded, and his court date was now postponed again. Um, and uh, it seems a lot of uh, a lot of support has been coming out for people that have been asking for it. Uh, again, on the website, there's an intake form, um, and again, this week there's several people that uh, that have uh, been going away um, for federal charges. Um, with medical marijuana in the state and uh, we have a section there for POWs and their stories are you know being written in their locations and how to contact them what to send how to help um, today uh, Lance and Ryan uh, both had to uh, turn themselves in and uh, and so there's been uh, the Lansing had seven and then there was a father and son out of Monroe um, that were all charged federally that lately have been having to turn themselves in from, you know, about three to four years all the way up to uh, the ones that took it to trial. It seems they, they like to punish them a little bit more um, if they go to trial. So they got five and ten years. Um, any any so, court uh, date? I know Bob Redden was yeah. mentioning a specific court date. Uh, uh, what else can we tell our, our listeners there, Steve? Uh, this upcoming week we also have, uh, I have a court date personally um, in Oakland County as well. Um, and my court date will be uh, June 4th at, June 4th, right? at uh, 8.30 a.m. in front of Judge Leo Bowman on the fourth floor. Fourth floor of which building? Uh, Oakland oh, County Circuit that. Court. And um, that's a bond review hearing. So uh, we'll be talking about what my bond conditions are, et cetera. Um, we also have on the, on the same day, we have uh, People versus Overholt, uh, which is out of Grand Rapids, uh, dispensary owner uh, that was uh, raided right after the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, that was doing caregiver to caregiver transfers. 
uh, ended up during the raid was under uh, 15 ounces and everything that a caregiver could have. Um, and so he's going to be battling it, battling it to the end on that one. And so he's got a, uh, it's another pre-trial. Um, they had one pre-trial before and some, uh, there were some questions that the judge had, uh, and some comments about uh, the difference of Oxycontin and marijuana. And so he wanted each attorney to uh, work on some points and some briefs and uh, get back to him. And so this upcoming date, they'll be uh, going over those new new details. All right. Let's uh, <clears throat> let's move on here, Steve. I appreciate all you guys are doing. Very, very good organization. I know from the perspective of representing patients, I know that, and they feel the community support. It makes them feel so much stronger in this very, very trying time, as I know you're going through. So thanks for all you're doing. I want to go next to uh, – we want to hear more of the updates as much as we can from you, Steve. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. Take care. You too. Thanks. Human Solution. All right, we're going to go to uh, Thomas Levine of uh, Cannabis Council. What's up, uh, Brother Council? How are you tonight? Hello, everybody. Everything is good. Good. Um, always a pleasure to have you on. I always appreciate your uh, thoughts and opinions, and I know uh, sometimes it's on uh, good topics and sometimes bad topics. In fact, immediately afterwards, we'll talk about the Kuhn decision just so we can at least get some joy. But this terrible thing happened this last week. I know it's a big uh, press conference, and your client, uh, the, the Duvals, were dragged away and, uh, as prisoners of war in this crazy thing of uh, on marijuana. Yes, very, very unfortunate. On um, the date of 420, 2012, at 420 p.m., a jury was instructed to convict these two. And my client, Jeremy Duvall, is already serving five years in West Virginia. Uh, my co-counsel, Mark Hart, represented Gerald Duvall and they were tried together. Uh, now, the son was uh, sent away last year, but Gerald, the father, um, did not receive his papers from the Bureau of Prisons to report until ne- um, more recently, and he reports next month. Now he's it's, got some serious uh, quite medical unfortunate. conditions. There's a couple things. He's got, a very serious, he's got a couple of serious medical conditions. He, of course was a patient, yes. and I know there's uh, there's another story of a, another patient, similar circumstance, I forgot what state it was, who died in federal prison because of lack of medical treatment, similar kind of... His name is Floor. Yeah. So has he, been, has he been not sentenced and taken into custody because of his, uh, his health? Is that what I understood, or is there another reason? Well, actually, no, they have every intention of putting him away for 10 years despite his poor health. The initial Bureau of Prisons letter um, was not sending him to a a high enough level medical facility, but we did get that corrected. Um, Unfortunately, though, we asked permission. I represented Gerald in the limited capacity of just moving the court for a motion to travel so Gerald could uh, possibly see his son before he goes away for 10 years. And and the court went off on a tangent, angry because Gerald had sold two greenhouses that, last time I checked, were not fixtures under real estate law. But they had this idea that these were fixtures. <laughs> and uh, these greenhouses, they wanted to get their hands on those as they as they got Maybe their they hands on his cars, cars and his other property and forfeiture. So it was It is all about the money. Yeah. Yeah, just unbelievable. I mean, really when it came down to it, Gerald had um uh adolescent onset diabetes, serious health condition. I have a brother who who got diabetes, uh at, his, at the same age of 11. And um, 
You know, they go through the quintuple bypass surgeries. Jerry did as well. Uh, kidney transplant, uh, serious eye problems, and circulatory problems, all very much helped with cannabis medicine. And um, the strange thing, you know, the factual situation here is we had Operation Hemp flying overhead. They come to the Duval farm. They tell the Duvals, oh, you better make your uh, um, fences a little higher and you better um, com- better comply with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act by uh, posting your licenses and gave them four or five pieces of advice. The Duvals followed that advice to the T and even more, putting up eight-foot-high fences with barbed wire on top with opaque greenhouses that nobody could see. And and uh, then those same cops took off their state hat, hat and put on their federal hat and came and raided them for following the very advice that they were provided. Just the, unbelievable. Uh, now, you know, I... I mean, I remember working with you a little on the case, and uh, it was an interesting strategy. Yes. You were not. You were allowed to discuss because they didn't. They didn't make you have some kind of pre-trial um, hearing, like a section eight. Am I right? You were able to discuss a little bit in a limited capacity relative to the entrapment by estoppel, right? That's right, and and that was sort of the way I shoehorned in the Michigan Medical Marijuana yes. Act, um, and I was it was a unique case in the sense that we were we were able to bring up the existence of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act in the federal court. Normally, that's cut off, but because it was relevant to an entrapment by estoppel defense, we were able to get that in, and we figured we got this case won. But yeah, the but they read the instructions. The instructions were like you are not to even contemplate that nonsense. They would say. Yeah, yeah, they went on to say if it was a state officer giving advice, then you're out of luck. But if it had it been a federal officer, then they could have uh, taken advantage of that defense. But there, but but the point is, even after hearing that, the instructions by the court, when they were, when you know, when the jury was uh, given the case to deliberate, was specifically as to not consider medical marijuana in your deliberations. Um, yes, yes, that instructed instruction was in there. Um, except to the extent that it was relevant to the entrapment by estoppel defense, but then it limited that by saying if it was a state officer that gave the advice, then the Duval should not have followed his their, the state officer's advice. Or, or you know, I mean, it's a, it's pretty ridiculous. Uh, had it been a federal officer giving that advice, then then they would have been covered. Is there anything else you would suggest? I mean, I remember, uh, you know, what sometimes people believe is evidence of their compliance in one jurisdiction is evidence of a crime in another jurisdiction. And I often say to people that, you know, you don't want to ever create a scenario where the police can walk out of that scenario with your evidence that you may want. So don't keep it on site. Don't have it stored on a hard drive. Keep it in a cloud, so only you and you and only you can access it. And I just remember, like there being, you know, they had like whatever limited records may have existed. They, you know, turned it around and tried to turn it into a, a traffic exactly. or what have you, making non-medical. I know that that's always the strategy. Yeah, they called it a drug ledger, and they surmised from these scribblings and these random calculations that that Jeremy Duvall. Had um, had compiled, uh, 
and they surmised that these hundreds of thousands of dollars were made. I mean, there was no dollar amount on any of the paper. Um, there was a, a, a list of, like, single initials and then some 2.5 figures, which seems to be in accord with the Michigan Act. He was <laughs> keeping track of uh, uh, of the patient's um, so that he doesn't give it a more than uh, 2.5 is, is what all I Let me ask you something. Would, were the people that were testifying about what those records meant drug enforcement officers who had been qualified as experts in drug trafficking? Yes, despite our objection, yes. And they were, given, they were giving an ultimate opinion on whether those kind of, you know, innocuous records and what they really meant really meant, in their professional opinion as an expert, as drug trafficking records. Right? Yeah, Is that how it goes down? Yeah. Yeah. And it was so obscure. And, I mean, and and Jeremy said, oh, once in a while I pick that pad up and I, you know, just jot some notes down. Uh, over here I was calculating, because they also sell trees. These were tree farmers. They were just shifting a crop from one type of tree to another, from their perspective. You know, and some of these figures had to be had to do with the, their pine tree business, even because they had made a living uh, raising pine trees and selling them all over the state. Let me ask him: Did the uh, did either of the defendant, did either Duvall, uh, father or son, testify? Uh, yes, they did. What and the their problem? patients, uh, the Jeremy's patients and, and uh, Ashley's patients, all got up there and testified to their ailments and the fact that they received their medicine from from these caregivers. Huh. What was the attack? Like, what was the prosecutor, the eight assistant, you know... Uh, Jerome Gorgon. But what was his position during Cross? What was he trying to get out of that? Yeah, he uh, he would basically try to make these people out as uh, phonies, you know, very disrespectful, uh, you know, have, showing no... Um, respect for their medical conditions or their or their choice of medicine whatsoever. Uh looking through the entire case through a prism of uh criminality and, and, and fear and and all the myths and underpinnings of of prohibition language and and vernacular. Um very unfortunate and um and uh, apparently the the jury was not able to free themselves of the vestiges of prohibition. Well, what would you say at the end of the day with, you know, where was the, uh, what was the whole thing with the jury? How did they, uh, was it just impossible for them to think otherwise because of the way the instructions were read? Or where do you see the, uh, you know, the, you know yeah. how they prevail. I I really think it was the confusing aspect of the state versus federal officer that that whole um, set of instructions that they you know the medical marijuana act is no defense to this federal controlled substances act. The uh, and if the advice given was given by a state officer then um, these defendants were unreasonable to rely upon the advice given. Um, so next time a state officer gives you any advice, you know, you better <laughs> not rely on it, I guess. I don't know. It's, it, was, it was very confusing for the jury to, to latch on to this apparent authority that I was able to get into the instructions I was able to argue that if there was an appearance of federal agency, then it would have been enough. So I pointed to the Coast Guard helicopter 
flying above. And this is little Petersburg, Michigan, who, of course, can't afford a helicopter to fly overhead for hours on end. Um, and we introduce the Operation Hemp website, which calls itself a federal program. I know. I remember uh, that was my involvement, and I was uh, honored to participate. You guys had uh, asked me to yeah. try to as a, testify as an expert in the Michigan medical marijuana law. And it was interesting because, like, the judge was had no idea what was going on and uh, took a little while. But uh, I don't know if it got you guys any leverage or not, but I know, you know there was a discussion. It's like, he's not going to say what the law is. I am. Right? So it was something that effect and I was like, okay, see you guys later. But uh Yeah, yeah. He really he really interfered. I you know, I could see him interfering with that and but uh yeah. an interesting experience on my end nonetheless. And just awful at uh you know and I you know I think there is that certain element where there's a compellingness to the jury. You know, it's one of those kind of undercurrents that you see sometimes uh in courts where uh you know, the judges offering their opinion without speaking it or saying it, you know, but kind of by, you know, illusion and, you know, things to that effect. Did you feel that in there? Yeah, yeah, through, throughout, really. And and the AUSA um, uh, was so dead wrong on their interpretation of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act because they were claiming that uh, there were... No circumstances under which a patient um, who has a felony could ever possess plants under the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. And, and they were going on and on that that was their whole premise. Well, Jerry can't have plants on his property. He's a felon. It says his primary caregivers can't be felons. I'm like, no, 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 no. He can be a patient without a caregiver, for example, and under those circumstances, he could have possessed those plants. And under 4I, he can be in the vicinity of medical use. Um, these, in this case, he was uh, actually, he had a caregiver, his son. And so he, he stayed out of the garden. They didn't have any evidence of him ever being in the garden. His, his son was fully competent as a horticulture. And, Where was that uh, litigated? What part was that litigated from the jury or pre-trial? Um, you know, the issue of the felon, pre- whether he was pre-trial. allowed to or not. Did the jury hear about that stuff? Pre-trial. Yeah, okay. actually, they they even tried to raise it again, even though we argued the law and briefed the court on that to try to correct that aspect. Um, that still came out at the jury. Hmm. And I think it prejudiced us, although we, you know, objected and, and, um, and the jury heard our side of it. It still prejudiced the jury, I believe. All right. Well, um, any any final thoughts for our listeners and going forward on this awful experience? Um... Well, I think that we're at... Uh, a swinging of the pendulum, and um, it's time to contact both our state and federal legislatures because I think it's going to happen in parallel to the soon that um, prohibition will end. Very well said, and I have to agree with you. It's a question of uh, how soon can we make it happen. It is really ridiculous, and I think about all the – this is just such a painful – you know, story, just, you know, human, you know, tragedy. You know, no one is oh. it's ridiculous. It's just so harsh, but... Uh, so harsh and so absurd, so lacking in humanity. What kind of a country puts people away in a cage for choosing the medicine of their choice? Sick man like this who knows his condition and has lived with it and has treated it. And to not be able to follow his own doctor's advice, just unbelievable. As what was said, I mean, I just can't even. Right, so uh, I know they were going to be following this story, and uh, 
some audio of uh, statements from Ryan Basor and Lance Forsberg. All right, so let's listen to those right now because I know we've got Kevin Spittler standing by, Thomas Levine Cam- right. Cannabis Council. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us and uh, giving us your insight on this, on this uh, dark time, I guess, for our community. All right, everybody. Hey, keep up the good work down there, Kevin, in Ohio. I've been following your progress. Thanks for your good work, man. I'll sign off for now. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Bye-bye. Okay, we're going to kind of hope that this works doing this. Uh, Kevin Spiller, stand by. I would just like to thank the great state of Michigan and all of its citizens for the uh, civil liberties that we have enacted, the power of the people that we have pursued, and the fighting of the injustices that we have endured. Uh, Though many of us are are facing incarceration and dealing with extenuating circumstances that uh, we never thought we would, we the people are fighting the fight, and we are perpetuating a cause that our children's children will thank us for. We are on the forefront of truly bringing to light liberty and justice, and I am just so proud of the medical marijuana community for doing as much as it's doing despite all the obstacles we face. We are a people whom have endured, will continue to endure, and despite everything they're doing to destroy our lives, we are facing these trials to better the lives of our children and those in the future. <coughs> sick, ailing, in pain, <coughs> or even just for the sake of civil liberty. Uh, as I head to West Virginia and begin a three-year sentence, I carry no guilt or shame knowing that I did the right thing with the right heart under the veil of our state law which gave me the protection, and it took an outside entity to come in like thieves in the night and destroy what we have created as a people in this state. And as long as we stick together, united we stand, and divided we fall, we will prevail. We need to, as a people, remember that we are each other's compatriots. We are each other's brothers. And we need to lift each other up, not tear each other down, because none of us are the enemy. And so as we continue to fight for this good cause, I just remind everybody this is in the name of freedom. This is in the name of civil liberty. And we will prevail. Good will overcome. I thank everyone for the support they have shown. My heart goes out to those that are being persecuted. But in the end, I know it will turn out for the better because we the people have spoken and it will be heard. So keep fighting the good fight and I'll uh, I'll see you all on the other side. God bless. That was Lance Forsberg. We have uh, Brian Basor as well here. Hello, this is Ryan Basor. I'd like to thank the whole medical marijuana community and the whole uh, legalizing uh, marijuana community. It's a uh, uh, proud of support they've shown me the last uh, three, four years and all the great new friends that I've uh, made. And uh, today, uh, this is, uh, I'm taping this Wednesday, but today is Thursday. So in the morning, I checked myself into Morgantown, West Virginia, and I got a four-year federal sentence. With the programs they have, I should be able to make it out back in Michigan to have my house in under two. So uh, keep up the fight. Uh, I can't wait to uh, read in the papers uh, about the legalization that happens with uh, Lansing, Jackson, Ferndale this year. Also, the house bill allowing the compassion centers. And then more importantly, I can't wait to see how uh, the whole community comes together and uh, goes after shooting on his re-election campaign. So... Peace, uh, love, and uh, keep up the work. Uh, it's a war out there. Some of us uh, um, are feeling it harder than others, but uh, we all live, uh, at least we, I live to fight another day. I know 
a lot of us have friends and loved ones in this community that haven't. So, anyways, that's it. I'd be happy to write, and uh, thank you all. Bye. Ryan Basar, what a great guy. So surreal to think that they're actually serving time in prison right now. When we were at the, we had a press conference uh, in regards to all of these uh, federal prisoners. Uh, there's seven in Lansing that have uh, been uh, convicted. There are the two Duvalls, and then also there's a Mr. Miskowitz. So that's a total of ten from Michigan. Uh, Carrie from the uh, the cannabis, uh, which is a, a big green bus that came from Arizona and stops at different cannabis events along the way, uh, explained that there are 200 people in federal prisons right now uh, that uh, uh, she, are. She in, really knew a lot of stuff. She was fantastic, say. wasn't she? Bob Bob Redden and I were both at the press conference, and uh, uh, at. She uh, mentioned 200 federal prisoners right now in uh, in jail for following uh, state medical marijuana crimes. She had a lot of signatures on that bus. Yes, she sure did. I've got some pictures of Bob signing the bus. Now, as far as the the, did we have any other uh, uh, callers that are holding for us right now? 27 minutes left. I think I want to take a quick break <clears throat> and come back and get Kevin on hold. We're going to talk to him. Ohio uh, Rights Group. Ohio Rights Group and. Uh, Rick, we're still coming to you with some news, so be ready. Moment's notice. Listen to Planet Green Trees. Call numbers one three four seven three two six nine six two six. We'll take a quick break and be right back. 